Hey everybody, welcome to the first episode of Old School Dives. I'm the king of all wrestling media, Gene Jackson, joined by the one and only professor of Peach State Wrestling. I just I just pulled that out of my ass. I don't know if he wants to be called that. Shane Knowles. Shane, how you doing, buddy? I'm good now that I've got a new moniker, Gene. Good to be <laughs> with you on this. And I'm excited about this new venture, man. I think we're going to do something a little different for some folks that uh, uh, don't normally get a lot of coverage. And I'll just expand on that before we get started. I mean, when Gene and I put this together, there's a thousand wrestling podcasts out there. You can find all the information you want on Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, Randy Savage, Steve Austin, and The Rock. But we're going to be doing some deep dives on guys that very influential and have a legacy in pro wrestling, but haven't been covered very much. Exactly. Uh, I'm excited about doing this. I've had quite a few people tell me they're excited to hear it. And, and anytime that, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 45 years old next month. Keep that on your hat. But uh, I, I've, I have studied wrestling uh, since I was about, I don't know, seven, eight years old. Of, I've, I've watched it. I've read every everything I could get my hands on. I traded for tapes and watched every tape I could get a hold of. And, and like I say, it's, it's, there's been times in my life when my, my mother would tell me like, Gene, there's more to life than wrestling. Like you need to, you know, find other hobbies and interests, but I never really have. So anytime that I can take this uh, wrestling obsession I've had most of my life and do something fun and constructive with it. Uh, I, I love it. And I think uh, the more, the more we've spoken off, off air and, and kind of talked leading into this, uh, I find that uh, I think me and you have very similar backgrounds as, as far as that goes, as far as our love of wrestling and, and uh, somewhat obsession with it. So I think it'll be good for both of us to be able to kind of share some of this, what some people would consider useless knowledge and wrestling fans would consider uh, interesting. We will find out as we go, but I think, uh, I think we've chosen a very interesting topic for our very first episode, Jesse, the body Ventura, uh, especially for a guy like me who in recent years has focused more on the uh, commentary side of things uh, is, is, the man, and not to jump ahead, but I just kind of preface this for the people who maybe only know certain aspects of Jesse Ventura. Um, he more or less is credited with inventing the heel color commentator uh, and and kind of define that role. Other than Roddy Piper in Georgia, there really was no one else who did that role the way he did uh, starting in 1985. But like I said, I don't want to jump straight to that, but I just kind of want to preface that because that's what people of, of our generation mostly know him as. So we're going to back up and talk a little bit about the wrestling aspect of Jesse the Body Ventura. And Gene, could you give us a picture for any of those who may be clueless as to who tonight's topic is about 2004 Hall of Famer Jesse the Body Ventura? So we're going to skim through, like, here's early uh, Jesse Ventura right there, 1981. There he is in the AWA, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but here he is uh, later down the line with, with Vince McMahon on the microphone, as, as most of us, like I say, are more familiar with him. And then, of course, uh, there he is on the set of Predator. Uh, once he comes I ain't got out. time to bleed. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the most fun thing to me about this is it's going to give a chance for us to show everybody your incredible Jesse Ventura impression. And eventually, by the time we get to the end of this, we get to this man, Governor mm -hmm. Jesse Ventura. Uh, so it's quite the it's quite the journey from this gentleman here that we started with to that gentleman we're going to get to eventually, who is was governor of the state of Minnesota, and, now, and you know what? A known conspiracy theorist. I was good. and what a what a first guy because I don't know not just anyone in wrestling but I don't know of many people in life that have had worn as many hats as Jesse. We're looking at pro wrestler, pro wrestling commentator, a mayor of a town I believe down in Tampa, Florida, governor of the state of Minnesota, actor, Navy SEAL, and then talk show and radio host. I mean, what a life this guy's lived. Absolutely. I mean, he. Uh... You know, before he before he became a wrestler, you know, he was uh, like you say, he was in the Navy. He was a Navy SEAL. Uh, he was around during Vietnam. And once he got out, uh, he eventually uh, took on the persona of a of a bodybuilder and uh, became a bleach blonde from California. Uh, kind of 
patterning, patterning himself after superstar Billy Graham, as many people did in that era. And initially, I don't, I don't think a lot of people realize this. He originally was Jesse the Great Ventura. It would be mm -hmm. a, a little ways into his career, a year or so in, when he finally makes it up to Portland, Oregon, working for Don Owen before uh, he becomes the body. Yeah, and out in Portland, uh, that's where Jesse kind of really, I believe, cut his teeth and got you know big before he moved on to the AWA with Vern out there with Don Owen, with guys like Playboy Buddy Rose. I think uh, that's where he and Roddy Piper first hooked up, which wound up being a friendship for life. I remember Jesse saying um, one of the last times he talked to Piper, said Roddy was his guy that kept him in the know in pro wrestling because once Jesse got away from the business, he didn't stay in touch with a lot of the boys, but said he happened to be uh, on the Tonight Show, uh, I guess for his talk show that was going to be on MSNBC, and Piper was there for something with wrestling, and they called up. And I just got to share this story, but said, you know, they were talking, and Roddy said, man, do you, do you miss wrestling? And Jesse said, of course not. He said, all those long flights and car rides and bumps and bruises and ice bags on my knees and time away from family, he said, hell no. And said, Piper said with a tear in his eye, he said, boy, I sure do. <laughs> yeah i mean that's um you know jesse was one of those that once he got out he kind of stayed away i mean he dipped back in here and there but uh he clearly didn't have the bug quite to the extent that that piper and some of the others did and so when he when he started out in the pacific northwest which is what the uh, portland territory is called uh he he held some championships out there he was pacific northwest heavyweight champion a couple of times he held the tag titles five different times, two of those being with uh, Playboy Buddy Rose, uh, someone mm -hmm. who I, I do definitely plan for us to get to uh, in due time here on this podcast. Anybody who doesn't know who Playboy Buddy Rose is, uh, they're, they're missing out. But today we're talking about Jesse. But eventually, you know, that he, he leaves the Pacific Northwest and he ended up in the AWA and uh, ended up holding the World Tag Team titles with uh, – Adrian Adonis. And so, you know, some people, again, depending on what age you are, how long you followed wrestling, maybe only remember adorable Adrian Adonis mm -hmm. in his latter years in WWF and, and back in the AWA. Uh, but in this era, uh, Adrian was in a, in a lot better shape. He was a lot, you know, he was a great, even as big as he was a great worker, but just a completely different worker than what most people remember him as. And him and, and tough as nails. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But there you see his, his biker look. Uh, of course, you know, he would be the, uh, were they the East West connection when he was teaming mm -hmm. with Jesse? Uh, then eventually, you know, Adrian would go on a team with Dick Murdoch and be the WWF tag team champions, which was an even more interesting combination. But again, somebody we may talk about in the future, but, mm -hmm. um, for, okay. So like I say, my initial, knowledge of Jesse Ventura picks up as WWF color commentator in, in the eighties, probably around eighties. Could you pop up that could you pop up that picture from the AWA again? Yeah. Uh with, with Gene, because I just wanted to touch on oh there we go. Uh, there we go. That one. Uh you know for a lot of younger listeners or viewers, uh if you're not familiar with it, if, if you are, I apologize. But just wanted to make mention you see in that picture Adrian Adonis and Jesse Ventura being interviewed by Mean Gene Okerlund. And I think a lot of people associate them only with the World Wrestling Federation. Uh, how much talent came over from the AWA, those three gentlemen that we're looking at right there, along with Bobby Heenan, Hulk Hogan, Rick Martel, so many. But, you know, you really think about what Vern had there in that late 70s through about 83, 84, before Vince went global. And I mean, he took... He I think he took about 65, 70% of the main portion of his roster. A lot of people only remember those later years of the, the team challenge series years of the mm -hmm. AWA when you had some, some guys who were well past their prime along with like Jake, the milkman Milliman and some of those guys, but man, in the early eighties, especially around this era, that picture was taken. Like you said, AWA had just, tons of great talent and that's how vince built the wwf for people you know who we're not going to go into that whole history lesson but if, if you mm -hmm. look if you look at that killer roster they had in the mid 80s i mean that was vince going and cherry picking 
the top stars from AWA, the top stars from Mid Atlantic, the top stars from Portland, and bring them all mm-hmm. together. Um, and that included Mean Gene and Bobby Heenan and all the great announcers that he had and everything. And uh, you know, a, like I say, Adrian Adrian Adonis is somebody who doesn't get his just due. You know, I think people just remember those last few years of his career, and he was a, a great wrestler. And him and Jesse was a great team, and he kind of covered up some of Jesse because I, I said this to you uh, off the air when we first started talking about doing this episode um i you know i know i knew jesse initially just from being the color commentator and the occasional match that he'd have like on saturday night's main event in the 80s but you know people who have talked to me about him and asked i said you know jesse ventura is a great announcer and as a professional wrestler he is an awesome (laughs) announcer (laughs) <laughs> if you go back and watch a lot of Jesse's matches, I mean, Jesse was mostly, he, he was more style uh, and and character than substance in the I room. mean, he had to walk in and talk and damn. Yeah. But in those days that you could get by with that, you know, it wasn't necessarily a, a bad thing, but uh, I just kind of pre-warning people who watch this episode, I go, there's a ton of stuff of Jesse's on YouTube. Me and Shane's been studying a bunch of it the last couple of weeks, getting ready for this podcast. Um, just know going in, like you're not going to see any five star matches, but very entertaining. Um, again, he he left the AWA. We're going to kind of skim over the AWA. Let's um, so let me pull up here and take a look at just to kind of give you an idea of uh, a few of the matches he had in the AWA, like. Uh, Hey, here, you know, St. Paul, Minnesota in 82, you've got Bobby Duncan, Jesse Ventura, and Ken Patera taking on one of the oddest teams I've ever seen on paper. Baron Von Raschke, Hulk Hogan, and Otto Wands. Wow. <laughs> Picture that. <laughs> so, but then that same year, that's in July of 82, you jump back just one month. Uh, you had Adrian and Jesse Ventura on a WWF Madison Square Garden show taking on the Strongbows, Chief J and Jules Strongbow. Mm-hmm. So, and that, you know, that was, was something that never would have happened later on. You wouldn't have seen those two guys, you know, jump from a WWF card to an AWA card within a month. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, in Winnipeg, you got Andre the Giant and Hulk Hogan in a handicap match defeating Adrian. Jesse Ventura and Jerry Blackwell. That match took place in two or three different big, uh, big cities for the AWA, and then, of course, they feuded with the High Flyers, Greg Gagne and Jim Brunzel. That's who they eventually won the mm-hmm. AWA Tag Team Titles from. And uh, Jesse, like I said, he had some uh, singles singles matches in AWA, but most of his success came in tag team matches with Adrian and uh, Mr. Saito. He had quite a tag team with Mr. Saito for a bit there as well. Um, And you brought up uh, Hulk Hogan, certainly a name that would be intertwined with Jesse uh, in the the near future from the time period of what we're talking about. Um, And one thing, too, I wanted to mention on Jesse, because this goes to AWA as well, uh, but certainly with the World Wrestling Federation. He, of course, we're just jumping along here. We're talking about his entering career. He said his two favorite opponents, and I don't think these guys get mentioned enough for how good of workers they were, Jimmy Snuka and Tito Santana. Jesse's went on the record at the Hall of Fame as well as on uh, another show with Chris Jericho saying, when I wrestled those guys, I knew the match would be good, and I knew it felt like a night off because those baby faces could sell and they could work at the right time. And he said he and Tito married at the hip. And I apologize if I'm off the number two, but he said they worked like 61 straight nights together. When Vince went global, he was like thinking about all those crews. They had an A crew, a B crew, a C crew, and sometimes even a D crew. And he was like, Tito and I, we're going into areas in the country that never even had wrestling. And he said, yeah, you know, we just became married at the hip together. But I thought that was interesting for him to say, favorite opponents, Snuka and Tito Santana, because those are two guys that right there in the expansion, and we'll talk more about the LJN figures, but their figures were right there at that first set, but Jesse considers them the best that he worked in the ring with. Tito Santana is an unsung hero of that era, and that's somebody I hope we we talk about at length on here in the future as well, Mm -hmm. because, uh, yeah, Tito, like, 
tell me a bad Tito Santana match you ever saw. I I can't name one. Uh, well, uh, and when the company when the company went global, you know Hogan, number one baby face, Snuka had been that guy right there off the Morocco feud and back when. And then, I mean, Tito winning the Intercontinental title that feud with Valentine, you could argue either of those with the number two baby face behind Hogan at the time. And and you have to think maybe that was the logic behind booking Jesse with Tito because they're like, well, you know, whatever Jesse lacks in the ring, it's going to be covered up by Tito's ability to work. Sure. Uh, and kind of Neil Taylor comment on what we said here said, you know, similar similar to Hogan, big character, not so much the wrestler. And that kind of, you know, that kind of sums up, you know, Jesse a lot because, like I say, it was all about the character work. Noah Howell says, uh, Buddy Buddy Rose and Doug Summers versus the Rockers, fair hold of spot for me is a great tag team rival. He mentioned that when we were talking about Buddy Rose earlier. And that is definitely a feud we will touch on when we get to Buddy Rose. Oh, the old casino in Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Neil Taylor also points out, El Matador was terrible, but Tito made it work. And yes, uh, El Matador, not his finest hour, but not his fault. Uh, but I always popped when he had his hat in his hand, and Bobby Heenan would talk about him yeah. carrying a chihuahua. To the <laughs> chihuahua. To the ring. <laughs> well, and the, we're talking about Jesse, and you just you brought up. So I know we're about to transition into the World Wrestling Federation. Am I wrong on this? Because I couldn't exactly find a timeline. Jesse had the first talk segment before the flower shot with Adrian Adonis, before Piper's pit with Roddy Piper. There was the body shot. With Jesse Ventura, and I think that was the first talk segment on WWF program. Buddy Rogers had one prior to that, um, but it wasn't anything of the magnitude. Like Jesse ushered in the modern, or well, I can't say modern because we're talking about the eighties, but the ones that built from Jesse to Roddy, Flower Shop down the line. Mm-hmm. Um, and is it, so this is interesting, um, Jet. Jesse debuted on commentary in January 1985 on All Star Wrestling, replacing color commentator Angelo Mosca. Okay, wow. think about that for a minute. If if you don't know who Angelo Mosca is, just go and search any episode you can find of All Star Wrestling where he's on color. There was a string of time there in WWF where the color commentator had a knack for not speaking English because you had Pat Patterson, whose English was not his first language, Angelo <laughs> Mosca, English, not a strong suit, Bruno San Martino, one of the greatest of all time, not one of the greatest speakers of all time. So no. when you go down that line and you go from Angelo Mosca to Jesse Ventura, uh, I mean, you can just imagine the impact that had. And so Jesse has said in interviews, he said that, Vince's one piece of advice going into this, taking over the color commentary role was, if you believe it, it's true. And so Jesse says he felt that gave him carte blanche to say anything because as long as he believed it, it was true. And so I, I always carried that in my mind. I read that a long time ago uh, from Jesse. And so I've always kept that in the back of my mind, everything I've done in wrestling as a heel. And it's also credited, too, because that was like a big game changer because Jesse being the heel color commentator was the first time that the viewer was able to hear things in real time from the heel perspective. You know, a lot of times they just had to read between the lines and figure out why the heel did the things they did. But Jesse Mm -hmm. was able to spell it out. Hey, this is why this guy's doing this. This is, you know, he feels justified because of this. And I know as a kid, there were times where I was like, man, I hate that guy, but, you know, I kind of get that. That kind of makes sense, you know? <laughs> and so I think that really changed a lot. You know, it really was a game changer as far as how a lot of people viewed wrestling because you were able to kind of understand if it wasn't spelled out 100%, you were able to kind of understand the heel psychology behind it. And I think that's kind of maybe when you started developing some heel fans, because yes, they were able to see that side of things and be like, man, I kind of I kind of associate with that. I get that. Because, as you said, Jesse, his convictions, he always believed he was right. And for those who think Jesse was just a heel commentator, there were so many times he would begrudgingly give a babyface credit. Like maybe I don't like the guy, but he pulled it out tonight. How can you question the ability? And I'm just paraphrasing here, but I think that's what made him great. And it's something that's lost on some of this today as we all try to 
be Jesse on commentary in these certain roles. You can't just be a heel, 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 heel. You're still there to be a commentator. And Jesse was great with the backstories of talking about what happened on Saturday night's main event, what happened on Wrestling Challenge, what we saw on Wrestling Spotlight, then tell you why he didn't like the guy and would use it in his own narrative. But I think, you know, and I think even sometimes he begrudgingly gave Hogan credit, uh, Tito Santana, who he called Chico to the point that Tito's autobiography is titled don't call me Chico, <laughs> by Tito Santana. But uh, I think that's something I really like. On Je- does that make sense? Like so many guys yeah. now as a heel commentator just want to be heel, heel, heel yeah, without actually, just, oh, I'm actually part of telling the story. You're just arbitrarily agreeing with, I mean, siding with every heel on the show. A lot of the things you're saying don't necessarily make sense. Um, I think that gave Jesse a lot of credibility because people were able to go, well, yeah, he sides with the bad guys, but he will give credit where credit's due a lot of times. You know, there's a there was a handful of guys that he normally just, you know, <laughs> he would almost always, always crap on. But like you said, even Hogan, I mean, was it after the was it after the Andre match where he said that like I think Hulkamania might live forever? Or maybe it was after the Warrior oh. match and WrestleMania. Oh, uh, after the Warrior match, that uh, particular that particular line about when Hogan came back in the ring to present Warrior the belt, and he said, because Mike Tyson had just dropped the world heavyweight title uh, two months earlier in February of 1990, and Jesse said, you know what, this isn't going to be a Mike Tyson Don King type affair. The man lost the belt, and he's going out a true champion. And I don't know if he'd ever spoke that glowingly, you know, no, of Hulk. Like that. It was that moment at the time, you know. Yeah, because like I said, there were some some baby faces he would give credit, where, you know, when it was time. But like he normally was always anti Hogan, which I, from what you hear is was kind of real life feelings coming to fr- coming to fruition at times. But um, yeah, I mean, even as a kid, I remember like, wow, Jesse said Hulkamania is gonna last forever. Well, that's crazy, mm-hmm. but. Um, let me let me ask you a question, Gino, to quote uh, Jesse here. I don't know if we'll ever know. None of us were ever in those meetings with Vince. But uh, going back to what we're talking about, the body shop, where Jesse was that guy that would go in the ring, win a match, come back on commentary and tell you that that's how you get it done. That's how you do it. If we are to believe, and I actually believe this because the time frame, early 85, late 84, before Jesse had the blood clot in his back and was still an active competitor. The the rumored WrestleMania one main event, Hulk Hogan defending the title against Jesse, the body Ventura. When the blood clot happened in the back, Jesse's out. We go with Piper, but we get the whole tie in with Mr. T. Somebody has to go with Piper. Orndor. I just wonder how much things would have looked differently if in Madison square garden main event, Jesse Ventura, Hulk Hogan, WWF title on the line. I think it would have been huge. I think if even if it hadn't have been a one on one, I mean, I think Jesse being in some version of that tag match um, with Mr. T involved and everything would have would have uh, made it even better. promos better. alone. Yeah, would have been absolutely, absolutely. I, I would. It's it's really a fun what if to ponder. Um, but at the same time, unless you did the deal where you know he gets up from the table and goes and has the match. I mean, who would you have plugged in that spot on color commentary? Um, I think he really helped the product along, especially in those big yes. events uh, alongside, you know, Gorilla and most of them and sometimes Vance, but especially those ones with Gorilla. Um, I think things kind of happened the way they, they needed to because I think he helped make the product bigger um, by being at ringside more than he could have been in the ring uh, because – to me, that's where his true talent lied was, you know, behind the microphone. Um, now, here's an interesting question. Uh, Neil Taylor asked, wonder if Jesse got the idea of some of those huge outfits and glasses from Elton John and some of the rock stars at the time? Um, I would think so. Uh, well, he, he used to make the joke on commentary that superstar Billy Graham has ripped off my look. <laughs> when the accusation, of course, was he did that yeah. from Billy Graham. Yeah, and it's funny because uh, – and then as he points out, like for WrestleMania, Jesse and Piper on one team. Wow. Um, and of course, you know, that would have been a, a precursor to when they did become a tag team later, which we will get to uh, <laughs> in due time. Teaser. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and I think that's actually from them in WCW. But of course, they work together a lot in the WWF as well. Oh, um, that one right there, Gino? Mm-hmm. 
that pick, believe it or not, that is from the 1990 comedy film Repossessed, starring the late great Leslie Nielsen from the Naked Gun fame. They did a parody of The Exorcist, and that is Gene Okerlund and Jesse Ventura in the film calling the exorcism like a true sporting event. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh wow, that's crazy! Because I would have swore that was from like a Clash of the Champions or something. Now here's. I mean, where do you see some of these other movie sales? Yeah, we get into his acting career. But. Look at okay, so look at that coat right there. Mm -hmm. now, Jesse got more mileage out of like different outfits because that coat, it's in the it's in the sitcom tag team. He wore it on commentary and on Superstars and like there's a lot of these out like that uh, the gold bandana. Uh, mm -hmm. He wore in the like Miller Lite commercial. Then you've seen it on Saturday Night's main event and pay per views and all that. Like he got the uh, the snake skin bandana. Yeah, I remember that yeah. one a lot. Yes, so he got he got plenty of use out of out of all the different uh, outfits that he wore in, in different situations. But uh, let's take a look now. You mentioned it kind of a while ago, but like uh, Jesse had the the yeah. famous. LJN figure there that eluded me as a kid. I never got, I never, of all the LJNs I had, uh, I never got that one as a kid, but I'm looking at right across from me right now. There's a case that there's about 40 of 50 of those in, and he's right in the front there. And that's what's so weird about the time those were made in 1984 with the first line. Jesse, I believe being in that first line, he might have been 85. He was no later than 85. He was either 84 or 85, still as an active participant. But because of production time, by the time the figure hit the shelves, he's in the booth. You know? Yep. Because it struck me weird as a kid because I came along kind of late. So by the time, you know, I started collecting those figures, I'm like, why are they get? Why is he in just wrestling tights? He's the commentator. And then, you know, then he, like I say, he popped up. You know, Saturday Night's main event. He teamed with uh, Orton and Piper against the Hillbilly team. That's uh, right. After, after they had crashed the wedding of Uncle Elmer. Oh, do you have that picture of from uh, Uncle Elmer's wedding? Where Jesse's wearing yeah. the there we go, <laughs> man. Go back and look at some of those insults on Hillbilly Jim, Uncle Elmer, and Cousin Luke that Jesse was firing in '86, and then of course wound up wearing the cake on Uncle Elmer's wedding on Saturday night's main event. What was the line on? Uh, they look like two carp when they were, when they kissed during the wedding. They look like two carp in the. <laughs> <laughs> in a river bank or so, I don't know, but it was, yeah. <laughs> because they said that uh, I've heard it said over the years that they said you know Vince probably fed him that line, or if not, he definitely popped for it because <laughs> Vince loved making fun of the hillbilly characters. Although ironically, he was one himself, apparently. But personal uh, preference, uh, did you like Jesse and Gorilla together on commentary, or Vince and Jesse better? I I I enjoyed. Um, I enjoyed Bobby and Gorilla so well that I almost preferred them, I guess, maybe or at least on primetime. I, I liked Jesse and Vince, but now Jesse and Gorilla had very good chemistry, and I did enjoy mm -hmm. them together also. But uh, I loved the way, and even though at the time I had no idea that Vince McMahon ran this, this thing or mm -hmm. any of that, but I just I loved the way that Jesse would – fight back and argue with him and, and was really give it to him more so than, than anybody else that ever did commentary with him. And the way he would just dump on San Martino. Cause I mean, I knew, I didn't really get to see much of his career, but I read enough magazines to know San Martino was a legend and, and, and Jesse would just be like, you idiot, you know, and <laughs> a Getty bender and all this pseudo racist stuff. And I think, it was, I think it was a perfect setup because Vince McMahon and Jesse Ventura were the soundtrack for Saturday night's main event for us. And then Gorilla and Jesse, the first six WrestleManias. Well, I mean, Jesse didn't work with him at Mania too, as we'll get to, but uh, you talked about making it larger than life. I mean, I, I didn't get a chance to order those on pay-per-views because where I lived out in the country, we didn't have pay-per-view boxes at the time. So, you know, you were getting the VHS sometimes three to five, maybe even six months after it happened. But, man, when you pop that VHS in, and I can't do a gorilla monsoon, but welcome, everyone, hanging from the rafters. You can cut the tension with a knife and – Jesse goes into the spiel. I mean, it felt like what they wanted, the Super Bowl, electricity, crowd going wild, those two meshing together, little things like Jesse saying, why don't you scarf down another hot dog, Monsoon? And they're dynamic with each other. Those two voices together were just 
and, and it's taking nothing away from Vince and Jesse because how many times do we see them on that platform stage in front of the crowd and Jesse smugging and posing, waiting for Vince to get done? But there's something about Jesse and Gorilla at those first few manias. That it really captured what I thought the company wanted for the Super Bowl of pro wrestling. And, and Gorilla, in my opinion, is, is very underrated uh, for how good of an announcer he was and how well he played yeah. off of anybody they put next to him, whether it was Bobby or Jesse or, or – even later on with Jim Ross when in his older years, like I don't think he gets the love that he deserves for no, how good and he me was. Personally, and like you said, the feeling that he brought to those broadcasts. I, for me personally, Gorilla has the best voice I've ever heard in wrestling for a play-by-play -play announcer. That doesn't mean I didn't like Gordon Soley or Jim Ross or even Lance Russell maybe better at times, but that booming voice of Gorilla Monsoon, goodness, I go back and watch stuff now and I'm like, I haven't heard anybody like him since, you know. And I'll tell you, and this is getting way off the topic of Jesse Ventura. I'm only going to say this quickly and then we'll move on. But I'll tell you a very underrated commentary duo, duo that I loved on the old, uh, like the 90s Coliseum videos and on All American Wrestling is the combination of Gorilla Monsoon and Johnny Polo. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That, that was a very fun because because Johnny Polo would make fun of, of Gorillas like because he had those standard lines he had said for years. Yeah, they're hanging from the rafters and the SRO signs went out mm -hmm. early today and he hit him in the external occipital protuberance or whatever you know like the back of his head. Yeah. And so and so oh, Johnny man. Polo, <laughs> Johnny Polo like oh he's coming he's like, he's a house of fire gorilla he's like a man repossessed and he's like it's possessed. But anyway, that's why <laughs> we may do a show on Johnny, just Johnny Polo. None of his other characters, just Johnny Polo, because I just think he's a very yeah. underrated character. But uh, anyway, I apologize for digressing already. But um, but yeah, so and i tell you something that stood out to me back in the day, too. Nobody put over Macho Man Randy Savage harder on commentary than Jesse Ventura. He was his number one fan and cheerleader. And uh, and so just from the way Jesse talked about him, I took notice of Macho Man a lot earlier than perhaps I would have just simply based off his talent and his entering. And they were a perfect combination. I mean, look at them. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if, if somebody said, can you show me a picture that this screams 80s? I was going to say 1985 in one snapshot right there. The MTV t-shirt, everything they're wearing mm -hmm. like that is just the picture book definition of, of the 80s. Right? Jesse looks like he got those big, uh, those sunglasses from the promotional giveaway at Pizza Hut during Back <laughs> to the Future. Those look exactly like those. Exactly. <laughs> you know, we were talking about building up moments. I won't go too far. But, man, WrestleMania three the Steamboat Savage match, and then the Hogan-Andre match. Jesse on those, my God, man. Just, he was there. He was there for it. <laughs> people, a lot of people don't, a lot of people underestimate the importance of announcers uh, for events and matches. And I, like you say, the Gorilla and Jesse Ventura especially, made what was already i mean because they had I mean, back in them day you you know you had months to build to these paper mm -hmm. it wasn't like we got four weeks to build savage and steamboat i mean that started back in what like october of 86 or somewhere mm -hmm. in there when they did the angle with the bell and i mean and they built it but man even if you if if, if you just invited a friend over and they hadn't seen any of it and they just sit down in front of the tv just the hype that they put behind it going into the match and during the ring entrances and stuff, you're like, I don't know what's going on, but this is a big damn deal. Apparently, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and like you said, really good at recapping everything that had gone on up to that point to kind of bring you up to speed. Had you not been watching. Um, but like you say, the hype going into Hogan and Andre, I mean, you thought mm -hmm. this is going to be the greatest thing that's ever happened anywhere, not just wrestling, just mm -hmm. period, you know? And Gene, we're talking around this little time period, WrestleMania two, uh, the only time that Vince has ever done WrestleMania from three different locations. And I believe we have a picture of who Jesse Ventura worked with out of the Los Angeles portion. Yes. Uh, Cassandra Peterson, better known as Elvira mistress of the dark. And, uh, that was I mean, something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how, how fun is that? I mean, you had, uh, Hogan and Bundy in the cage getting called by Jesse and Elvira and, uh, 
<laughs> I mean, you know, I, I don't know that Elvira would would have probably looked out of place standing next to Vince or Gorilla or any of the other people. But when you throw her out there with Jesse, you're like, well, why wouldn't she be at wrestling? Oh, she's right at home. Yeah. <laughs> this makes perfect sense. And I was going to bring up, it was right around this time period that WrestleMania 2, Jesse almost changed professional wrestling as we knew it. Tried to put together the wrestlers' union where he had, I believe, 85 to 90 percent of the locker room that we're going to stage this big revolt and walk out we want guaranteed money we want insurance we want benefits if we are to believe and i've heard a lot of different stories over the years you know we had morocco we had orndorff he had snooka she but hulk hogan being the face got wind of it snitched it out to events and from that point on the spring of 1986 started jesse basically having nothing to do with hulk hogan going forward yeah, I mean, you, you have to wonder what wrestling as a whole would have looked like had he had he pulled that off. And of course, you know, Jesse is the one that introduced uh, managers, not Bobby Heenan, but I mean, like agents and, and mm -hmm. business managers into the business, which was a big game changer for a lot of guys, including like the the Kevin Nashes and Scott Halls of the world later on down the line, Lex Luger, I mean, a lot of guys that that's when those big money contracts and long-term deals started coming out. You know, like you hear, I was just listening to uh, Mick Foley's podcast where, you know, he signed one of the last opportunity deals where he got the old mm -hmm. five years at five matches at $750 a year, 150 per match, whatever that worked out to be. Um, and so Jesse helped usher in this, new regime of, of guys that had like, you know, Barry Bloom and these different, you know, he, well, he, man, he and represented a lot in, of people. In, in, in his Hall of Fame speech, you know, for, he said that was his proudest moment was I made Vince McMahon sit down with an agent, uh, not just an agent, like Hulk Hogan had one that did his movies and commercials, but an actual agent for professional wrestling. And he said, I made Vince sweat bullets in his own office, but, um, you know, Kind of a trendsetter in a lot of ways on this stuff. It was because, I mean, this is kind of jumping ahead, but, you know, wrestling didn't have an established uh, system of, of how they handled royalties like other businesses yes. did, music and even acting and different things. And, you know, um, you know, he went back and sued for all those royalties for the Coliseum videos and things he did and ended up winning a, a pretty substantial judgment. And that changed the way that was handled moving forward. Yes. Put a lot of money in a lot of people's pockets. There you see his WWF uh, trading card. And, of course, before that, we kind of – I missed it earlier when uh, we were talking about, like, the AWA, but this is probably the first line of wrestling trading cards. Wow, I haven't even before. seen that one before. The wrestling all-star cards, they're worth some money if you can track them down. Um, but, yeah, that's Jesse's card from the first line of wrestling cards. And we were talking about the agents and whatnot, something that he forced, uh, that picture from the movie Predator in 1987, when uh, basically Vince said, no, you can't make this movie. And if you do, I'll fire you. And Jesse said, I'm going to make the movie. And he did. And then you see Dick, Dick Ebersol from NBC saying, look, I signed on to Saturday night's main event for Jesse Ventura. Get me Jesse Ventura. And Vince was hamstrung. Brought him right back, and that's when Jesse knew he. I mean, this stuff didn't happen for anybody who's listening. There wasn't people that challenged Vince McMahon and won. I mean, you were just let go fairly or unfairly, and Jesse was a guy that kind of put the toe in the sand, and uh, that kind of led to Piper being able to do They Live, I think, because even though Piper had his own problems with Vince, he knew what Jesse had got away with and was like, well, I can go away for a little while. You'll need me. Jesse, yeah, Jesse put a lot of money in a lot of people's pockets over the years that they may not even realize. He certainly doesn't get all the credit he deserves for it. So I, I think it's and, kind uh, of here to kind of step off into the uh, the movie. Go ahead and finish. Uh, what you're about I was going to say, I was going to say, yeah, the movie, the Predator. Do you have one from the Running Man? Him in the uh, blue blazer, and no, I don't mean Owen Hart, but with the uh, hairpiece. Now that is from the movie The Running Man, his second film. 
that he made with Arnold Schwarzenegger along with Predator. And uh, Gene, you remember Jesse on commentary talking about what good friends he was with Arnold. And when we would walk down Venice Beach, they would all stop and look at his physique and Arnold would have to go get a protein shake because he was getting no attention. <laughs> I love stuff like that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he even he, though Jesse had bit parts in these movies, and Arnold was the star. Yeah, of he worked he worked them into the commentary. Uh, Captain Freedom. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, some of these you're going to have to kind of shed a little light on what some of them are. Now, you told me before we went on the air, but you got to retell this of what this picture <laughs> represents, right? Oh, sure. That is from the uh, sequel to Major League, Major League Two in 1994, where Willie Mays Hayes in the movie, uh, after the Indians had won the division, uh, the AL pen, the American League pennant, whatnot. Anyway, within the movie, he had gotten too focused on commercials and movie appearances. And he's like, check out my new my new movie, and he pops in the VHS for his teammates, and it's an action film, Black Hammer, White Lightning, and you see these two guys straight out of Miami Vice shooting guys off of a, a building, and you see the corpses pile up, and Willie Mays Hayes said, mine fell the hardest, and Jesse said, mine are the deadest, and they both laugh at each other, then turn to the screen and laugh, and his teammates are like, the hell? But even just little stuff like that, a cameo in Major League Two as an action star. Um, if uh, if you're listening to the audio version of this, which will be coming out in the next couple of days, we're, we're doing this live on Wednesday night. Uh, if you're if you're listening to the audio version, find the video version on Facebook or YouTube. It's worth it just for this one picture right here of Black Hammer <laughs> White the, the cheesy smile on their face from uh, delivering that line is <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, we we can go through the other movie we've done. Let's see, we did Predator, The Running. Man. Now that's Demolition Man, yeah. 1993, with uh, Sylvester Stallone and Sandra Bullock and Wesley Snipes. Um, that of course, well, that's one of the more Awful movies I've ever seen in my lifetime. 1997's Batman and Robin with George Clooney as the Cape Crusader and Jesse was uh yeah, a prison guard in that well, film. That's one of the worst. Did you did you see this movie? <laughs> <laughs> I did Abraxas in nineteen ninety. I begged my mother to rent it for me at Kroger. Yes, when Kroger supermarkets had the VHS section, you know, between the wine and the popcorn. And I didn't know anything about it. I knew it had Jesse Ventura and it had Jim Belushi, and I wanted to see it. And boy, did I regret it afterwards. It, <laughs> yeah, I never saw it back in the, that one. Slipped past me somehow, and uh, me and my wife, like you know, we're Mystery Science Theater fans, and we of course went from that into watching those riff tracks, where it was just those guys without the space gimmick or whatever. And one of the movies was, it said, a bracket starring professional wrestler Jesse Ventura. I'm like, oh, we're definitely watching this. And mm -hmm. I can't imagine watching it without the them making fun of it because, oh, my Lord. Oh, my now, this is this is what I've wanting, wanted to build to right here. Uh, we alluded to it earlier. So in, in around 80, late 89, early 1990, uh, there was a television pilot made uh, starring Rowdy Roddy Piper and Jesse. And it was called Tag Team. And so the premise of Tag Team, and I'm, and, and if you haven't seen it, uh, go on YouTube. It's on. Just put in Tag Team, Jesse Ventura or Roddy Piper or both, and, and the, the full episode is on there. So the premise of Tag Team, these guys are tag team wrestlers, and we go to a big show, and they're in the dressing room, and they are approached by a woman who apparently is supposed to be a promoter of some description, with a sidekick who looks like a shrunken uh, Polly Walnuts from The Sopranos. And <laughs> now keep in mind, this is in 1990s, and kayfabe is still alive and well and thriving. No internet, no, you know, very few people knew what a dirt sheet was. So she comes and tells them to take a dive in their upcoming match. And uh, they're, they're not happy about it. So they go out to wrestle the Samurai Brothers who are played by Pat Tanaka and Akio Sato, the Orient Express, along mm -hmm. with Mr. Fuji, although his, his name escapes me, what they called him. Um, and they go out and they win the match when they weren't supposed to. So they're blackballed from the wrestling business. And so now the rest of the pilot follows their adventures trying to find a new career on the other side of wrestling. So the first thing they do, they go and they try to be movers. And so they're moving p a piano down several flights of stairs that gets away from them, crashes. This is a pretty action-packed pilot, by the way. 
yes, it covers a lot of ground. <laughs> this this piano crashes through a brick wall and crushes the truck they were in and allows Jesse to deliver the most 80s line ever. I think we crushed the truck, Rick. <laughs> or no, I'm sorry. I think we body slammed the truck, Rick. And then it was just cheesiness like that. But eventually, we're not going to recap the whole thing. We may eventually, we may do a watch along of tag team someday. That hey. Might be, that might be a fun one. Uh, after uh, stopping a robbery attempt at a grocery store they're at, they end up going into the police academy. And that's their names there, Youngblood. Is that not the most 80s last names ever? <laughs> and and that was the great thing to me, too, is like in the wrestling scene, like Jesse was just Jesse. He was, he was uh, what was it, Billy the Body Youngblood? And he dressed exactly mm-hmm. like Jesse Bobby Ventura. He was just Billy the Body Youngblood. Wasn't much of a reach here, yeah. No. Now, Piper had on a little different gimmick, and I think he was – Rick McDonald, something Rick McDonald, quick Rick McDonald or some such Mm -hmm. similar to his character in body slam, which is something else we may touch on one of these days. Cause that's fun. Break out that soundtrack. I guess. (laughs) Oh, hell yeah. No (laughs) doubt. But, uh, so yeah, so the rest of this episode follows their adventures going to become policemen. And, uh, I guess the rest of the series would have been on followed down that road, but unfortunately it was cut short. So, uh, uh, Two things about tag team. They brought in the writers from Magnum PI uh, once they thought they were going to get greenlit for a full season. And I talked to you about this off air that I believe it was Viacom production company doing with NBC. They had a split among themselves and Viacom went with a different network and that kind of left tag team and some other projects just hanging out to dry. But uh, Jesse said that the idea for that show came about from a six-year-old boy who was watching the World Wrestling Federation programming. He just turned to his dad and he said, Dad, I wonder what it would be like if wrestlers were cops. And so he had his son write like a little letter. And somehow somebody got a hold of this. It became a script and a thing. But I thought, you know, just amazing. You never know where ideas would be dreamed up from. Wow, that makes that show make so much more sense now. Uh, Wes Nail says he was the only good thing in Batman and Robin. The only thing. No, I can't argue that ever. Wicked Nemesis says it was a good, bad flick, which could have been any. I, I'm guessing maybe based on the time, uh, they may have been talking about a Braxis. Then again, it could be pretty much any of those movies we just listed. When I, when I look, we, we all look back fondly on some stuff from the 80s and 90s through a nostalgic lens. But in 1997, Batman and Robin was dog doo doo, and I defy anybody to argue that. Jackson is the goat. Well, bless you, Dalton Beckworth. You're a uh, you're a good man. I appreciate you saying so. While we're uh, free, I want to bring up something too that I saw uh, while doing research on this: the David Schultz incident, yes. slapping John Stossel. There's a video on YouTube of Jesse being interviewed, just about random things, and it came up on the uh, John Stossel incident. And Jesse said, "I was there in the hallway." When he slapped him not once but twice, you think wrestling's fake, you think wrestling's fake. But the interviewer said, uh, you know, and Jesse said, well, he made the cardinal mistake. He insulted wrestling fans. And the guy said, oh, because they pay money? And Jesse said, forget the money. He said, wrestling fans, the most loyal, true blue fans on the planet of any medium. He said, more than baseball, basketball, football. He said, you get diehard wrestling fans and you insult their intelligence. And it backfired on him. Jesse went on in that interview to say everybody thought, oh, no, this is the black eye for wrestling. And he said, we were sold out in Detroit and in Chicago. And in Detroit, there was this big banner saying 2020 sucks <laughs> from the top that the fans had made. And I just he said that in his Hall of Fame speech in 042. He really spoke about wrestling fans. And I think that's something that really happened to us on a lot is in anything I've ever seen, Jesse puts over the fans as the greatest in any medium of entertainment. I think it's from the heart. Because what he said, it's not just about spending the money. It's their time and their passion that they put into it. And and, and that's something that I guess people kind of picked up on later on once he moved in his political career. You know, Jesse Jesse is a very intelligent guy. And you didn't always yeah. pick up on that necessarily by some of the things he would say on commentary because he would, intend, I, I assume, intentionally would say things wrong or maybe that's just how he talked. But yeah. one that always sticks out in my head, and I just watched the match recently, is why it's in there. I was, I was watching Sting Invader from Great American Bash 92. 
And Jim Ross is like, they need to get Harley Race away from ringside. And Jesse Ventura says, why? He ain't done nothing. And Jim Ross said, I ain't say he done nothing. I just said he need to get him away from <laughs> And it's just like the, <laughs> the, 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 the irony of Jim Ross correcting someone's <laughs> mm-hmm. their grammar. <laughs> someone's grammar is, is priceless to me. And we'll get this in real quick. James Hardy says, Demolition Man is one of my all-time favorite movies. Well, bless your heart, James. It's not the fact that it didn't star Bill Eady and Barry Garso is a missed opportunity. Exactly. Uh, You know, you you spoke about Jesse and one thing in WCW. Well, two things in WCW come to mind. One, when he was introduced to the crowd, uh, I think it was by Shivani, and it was in Milwaukee. And Jesse knew that's where one of the big uh, motorcycle gangs was headquartered. So he came out making his WCW debut on one of those brand and it escapes me. I think that's where Harley Davidson Harley Davidson is maybe yeah. yeah. The yeah. First came out on the Harley. Oh my gosh. This you pandering to the walk, crowd was you great. come out on American made Harley Davidson. Yeah. <laughs> and two, we know the the main event of Starcade in ninety three. Yeah, with uh Flair and Vader in Charlotte. And I'm sure we've all heard the stories about how Vader was stiffing Flair in that match and Harley Race telling Flair, if you don't do something about it, he's going to kill you. If you go back and watch that match, once Flair has been bloody from the clothesline from Vader and really starts fighting and giving it back to him, man, listen to the passion and energy in Jesse's voice because he knew it was a fight at that point and Flair was bringing it. Like There was an enthusiasm in Jesse's commentary from the rest of that match from that point forward. And, and yeah, that was something else that you could tell about Jesse too. You could tell when he, when he was getting like involved, emotionally in, atta- attached to a match and involved because he was always good. But like you say, in that one, like he may, if you weren't feeling it already, he made you feel it because of how mm-hmm. he described what was going on. And that's, that's an all time favorite match of mine. Cause I was a big Vader fan. And of course, you know, who's not a flair fan and they're in his hometown at Starcade and all mm-hmm. that. That's uh, one of my th- probably top five favorite matches there. But speaking of, so, you know, like you say, Jesse came to WCW and, uh, you know, pe- some people love WCW. Some people hate it. Some people are indifferent. I was always, to me, I was never an either or fan. I loved WWF. I loved WCW. I loved Continental Memphis. I loved any wrestling I could. We consumed it all that we could. And mm-hmm. so, but. I really felt like at that time period, Jesse really brought something to the table for WCW. And I was super excited to see him there and have him there on the call with Jim Ross. And like, like you said, it's like the fine examples of a Starcade match, but I really thought he brought something to the product that it needed and uh, made the shows for me, for me at least a lot of fun. And I know Jim Ross has said in years, you know, over the years and in, in recent times that, you know, he was a little bitter about how much money Jesse made and how you know well they treated him and as light his work schedule was. And he was kind of bitter and wasn't probably wasn't as great a sidekick to him as he could have been. But I always I always liked their commentary together. I thought it was fine. Great job. And we talked about his attire. Goodness, some of those outfits he wore at Beach Blast or Bash <laughs> at the Beach. Oh my yes. God. And the, both Beach Blast, you know, he started out up there. Uh, in the sand with some of the bikini girls with him and brought them down to ringside. And then, of course, you know, he was involved in the Missy Hyatt Medusa yes. bikini contest and, <laughs> and all that. That's right up his alley. Yeah. Anytime oh, yeah. somebody, didn't he also, didn't he also uh, mediate the Dino Bravo Ultimate Warrior pose down? Yes. They See, always went to Jesse yeah. on something like that when it was an angle alert. He, he, you know, there was the controversy because he, he did the, uh, the Dino Bravo where he went for the world record bench press. Mm-hmm. And there was the controversy of whether, and Jesse's like, I'll put 12 pounds of pressure on my fingertips. And that still means mm-hmm. he lifted 927 or whatever, mm-hmm. <laughs> or whatever yeah. the, the minute detail was. And then of course, like you said, the, the pose down with a uh, rude and, uh, warrior at the Royal rumble that year. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I always thought that was funny the way he would f- explain away his his assistance of Dino Bravo in the Mitch mm-hmm. Press uh, record. And again, that's one of those things that if you'd have just had you know Sean Mooney or somebody out there, that bench press thing would have been a just complete snore fest. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he made it you know worthwhile and, and it, it helped get Dino Bravo over. And God knows 
getting Dino Bravo over was not <laughs> was probably not easy. Call task. <laughs> Call task. And I think in 94 at Bash of the Beach when Hogan debuted, if memory serves, Jesse commentated a lot of that 94 Bash of the Beach, but he was gone by the end when it was time for Hogan and Flair. Yep, they uh, they split it with Heenan, and uh, they brought Heenan out for uh, for Hogan's match. Here's something I meant to show before we kind of, and I know we're kind of back and forth, but before we move to the WCW sure. thing. So um, Jesse Ventura signed on to be part of a Sega Genesis wrestling video game, and this ended up being the final straw. Like you said, you know, he pushed the envelope with, and again, there's that bandana that he wore in the Miller Lite commercial. <laughs> uh, tastes great, less filling. Um, you know, he signed on to do this Sega Genesis game, and Vince said, no, you can't do it because we have a contract with Nintendo. They make our games. You can't do it. And Jesse's like, well, I'm going to do it anyway, which in the end, he ended up signing with WCW and WCW had a deal with Nintendo. He ended up not doing the game anyway. But it's funny of all the movies and trying to form a union and all the things that Jesse did that he managed to stay through. It was a silly video game that ended up being his undoing that had him out of WWF after all those years. Well, I say all those years. And that's the thing, too, is like he was only there like five years initially, but it felt like mm -hmm. way long. felt like forever. Yes. Um, so, you talk about leaving w been around three years already. Uh, you know, that's that's more than half the time that Jesse spent in the WWF. That's crazy to even think about. And we talked about him leaving WCW 94 uh, during that time period, becoming mayor uh, down in, a, I think, a city on the outskirts of Tampa, Florida, which was his first dipping the toes into the political uh, field. But then in 1998, shocking the world, running on the Reform Party, uh, winning the governorship of the state of Minnesota. And I mean, I know now it seems commonplace for I mean, goodness, we've had Donald Trump, leader of the free world. But in 1998, Jesse Ventura, I mean, the, the gentleman's last name, I believe, was Humphrey, if I'm getting that right. But he was the grandson of the, the big governor that, that did really you know, put Minnesota on the map. And Jesse didn't enter the field until late. And people thought, well, this is all this sideshow. But Jesse running on that independent ticket, the Reform Party, and he was the first guy to really utilize his campaign on the internet because in 1998, you know, it's Netscape and AOL and it was all radio. It was all TV, but Jesse really pushed on this internet medium and shocked the world. And I was thinking about it. I looked up on eBay to see if I could find one. You still see them to this day, but you know, not like I live in Minnesota, but I hear people tell me, but from 98 to 04, it was very popular to see coffee mugs and bumper stickers with the depiction, my governor can beat up your governor. <laughs> I've seen those. Uh, I've, I've tried to locate one for this show and couldn't find it. But yeah, that's fun. Um, and they made a, and I had those pictures and I guess I didn't upload them, but they made like a series of dolls where there was like one in his Navy outfit and one in a suit for his governor. And then there was a third one, like kind of like a wrestling outfit that was, those were made to help his campaign, you know, at the time of when he was running for governor. And, uh, that's pretty huge. I mean, for, uh, for, uh, cause you know, all us wrestling fans, you know, love wrestling and, and respect these guys, but outside of the wrestling bubble, it's really hard to get the general public behind anybody who's in remotely linked to professional wrestling. So to become the governor of a state, you know, like Minnesota is a pretty, pretty tall order. And then he, he pulled it off. Um, I'm surprised we haven't seen more people following his footsteps. You know, Jerry Lawler mm -hmm. tried to be mayor, mayor of Memphis, and, mm -hmm. you know, that didn't pan out. And uh, who's to say? I, I wouldn't be shocked if in our you know, in the next few years we don't see The Rock as the president of the United States. Right. It, could, it could very yeah. easily happen. Uh, but, again, that's, that's Jesse Ventura uh, leading the way for other people in wrestling to think outside of the wrestling box. And, again, you know, yeah, you had Hogan had his part as, you know, Thunder Lips and Rocky Three and all that. But he was the first guy to really break out there and start having consistent roles, even if they weren't big roles, yes. still consistent roles in, in big budget movies that weren't just like, you know, straight to video type stuff. Then, of course, Piper fought along and they live. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think 
a lot of Piper's movies were underrated. I remember being in college, yeah. reading uh, a lot of those straight to video movies were actually you know pretty good because him was, and uh, Billy Blanks co-starring Blanks together in a lot of those films of Tybo fame eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, Quick and Deadly, and uh, yeah, there's quite a few of those mm -hmm. that I, I used to watch. I was a huge Piper fan. Me too. Me hey, we talked about Jesse, and this is something that I remember ordering the pay per view. But in 1999 less than a year into his governorship, uh, Vince McMahon always wanted to capitalize on something that's popular, needed a special guest referee for SummerSlam 99, the triple threat for the uh, world title with Mankind, Triple H, and Stone Cold. So he brings back Jesse Ventura. And I remember at the time, but I remember it, I mean, it means more now. Jesse was just slammed, not body slammed, but slammed in the media. This is terrible this is disgusting. He can't keep his foot out of that three ring circus. And once they got wind that he was getting paid a hundred thousand dollars, all the governor cares about money. What they didn't realize was he'd split that $100,000 two ways. One for a disadvantaged children's foundation. And the other went to his alma mater, his high school in Minnesota. But I remember when they brought him out, and he grabbed the microphone from the Fink, Howard Fink, when he's sporting the stripes. And he said, I just want to say something. There's a lot of media saying I'm a disgrace for being here tonight. But I'll tell you this. I'm proud I'm a wrestler. I'm proud I was a wrestler. And I'm damn proud to be here tonight. I remember just coming off the couch, man. Like, yeah, screw the media, dude. Like, <laughs> and you know nobody popped bigger than Vince McMahon to hear him say that yes. publicly. You know, so... Good for him for doing that. Well, hey, I remember him saying, and I, I found this on YouTube. I'll make it quick. There was a press conference after SummerSlam, and Jesse was like, yeah, I'm a governor. That doesn't mean I forgot how to have fun. And he said, SummerSlam is on Sunday night. Do you think that's when I'm at my most busiest in my office? <laughs> I mean, you gotta love the guy because he's. All, I mean, he's always spoke his mind over the years, straight up until you know recent times. Like I say, he's he's most known now for you know his conspiracy theory show and stuff like that. But like he's, you know, he's called out a lot of people, you know, in the government, and you know, mm -hmm. said some controversial things that a lot of people felt like needed to be said, and not many other people besides Jesse the Body would have had the nerve to say it, and especially say it on record publicly. So. You got to respect the guy for that. And, you know, there's a picture online. I, I guess I didn't upload it to the podcast here, but I guess he dipped back in uh, around that same time. There's a picture of him going to the ring with Brock Lesnar when Brock was still – he was still working. I don't know if it was a dark match or what, because it was around the mm -hmm. time Brock was at OVW because he was in his, like, singlet and all that. There's a picture with, like, Jesse with his arm around him and him walking down the ramp. Oh. I guess maybe it was like a house show in Minnesota or something, but I, I thought that was kind of. Do you remember the? Do you remember when Raw was doing the guest host and they brought in Jesse to be the guest host of Raw, and for him to wear that black and metallic jacket with the head? And of course, Vince McMahon was a heel at the time, and they did those vignettes where Jesse said, "I'm one of the only people in this building that remembers your father and working for your father, and your father made you an announcer, which you hated." And he said, "That's what you're going to do tonight with me." When we announced this battle royal, and Vince has to come out in the old, of course, he looked different now than he did in yeah. 85, 86, but wearing that old tux with the red bow tie and the fact that he brought him out to the song Obsession by Anna Motion, which was the old intro theme for Saturday Night's Man. And what I love, Vince was such a heel in the beginning of that battle royal, but then he started settling into it. Oh, no, he's eliminated. Oh, no, he's not. And Jesse's saying, like, stay right here, McMahon. I mean, it felt... Like a kid again, they just them doing the battle royal with Randy Orton. In. <laughs> so, so we pretty much covered the career of, of of Jesse pretty thoroughly, I think. Here, um, what what would be the final word you think uh, as Jesse Ventura that Jesse would 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 have to say about tonight's podcast? <laughs> I think you guys didn't go long enough. I think you shortchanged me on this, and I guarantee you that Stu Jokerlin, he's behind this one, Gino. <laughs> Perfect. So we want to remind everybody that Old School Dives is brought to you by Pro Wrestling Live, which takes place uh, each month here in Gadsden, Alabama. They're at Times Square on Locust Street. And stay tuned to all our different social medias to find out when the next big Pro Wrestling Live event will be taking place 
here in Gadsden and potential future future shows from Peach State Wrestling, which is also mm -hmm. one of our many sponsors here, along with GPTV Live, which happens on Sunday nights at 6 p.m. This Sunday night, uh, we're going to be joined by Michael Stevens, a guy that I know you're very oh, familiar cool. with, and uh, we're pretty excited about that episode. It <laughs> should be a lot of fun. And if you enjoyed tonight's show, and even if you didn't, give us another shot, okay? We're working on this. This is a work in progress. I've, I've had a great time tonight. I hope everybody else has too. So coming up in two weeks on Wednesday, July the 6th, if that doesn't work for Knowles, we may have to, we may have to reschedule it. I'm just shooting. It'll two work. Now. Episode number two is going to come out, and our subject will be Tommy Wildfire Rich. And uh, how do you start to have somebody get something on me? Boom, there you go. And I'm excited. Who knew Tommy was here? Because, yeah, he's 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 lurking. I figure he's gonna he's gonna show up for if he sees this on Facebook, he may show up. He, we may have him as a guest or something. You never know because <laughs> he may message me like, I didn't know I was gonna be on your show. But Tommy Rich is actually a guy that over the years. Um, I've had some interaction with, uh, I worked some shows with him over in Mississippi. Uh, I've, I've had, we've talked about off the air, some encounters I've had with him like at WrestleCade and some of the Greg Price uh, NWA mm -hmm. conventions. I know you have too. I know you've worked yeah. with him in a, a number of different ways. And so not only are we going to recap his career, because again, this is a guy, youngest NWA world champion, wrestled all throughout the territories and plus in WCW had a big career, but you don't hear him getting a lot of love. You don't hear people acknowledging that. And when Ted Turner put wrestling on the superstation, Tommy Rich was the most popular baby face in the country at that time. And, and my first, the first memory that really stands out to me, I'd seen him before that, but like, the thing that I really, really remember, remember, like locked him in my mind. He was a heel in Memphis, teaming with Austin Idol, mm -hmm. and they rammed Jerry Lawler's nuts into the ring post, <laughs> and eventually shaped. Well, eventually gave him a haircut. We called it a head shaving, but mm -hmm. they had about a number five guard on that bad boy. He just had that top, <laughs> but they nearly burned the Col the Mid South Coliseum down because of it. Uh, that's that was when he really, you know, was etched in my brain, him and Austin Idol, along with Paul Lee Dangerously as their manager there in Memphis. One of my all-time favorite angles. Uh, we'll talk about that and a whole lot of other stuff involving Tommy Wildfire Rich. The next time you join us here on Old School Dives, anything else you want to add before we wrap this one up, Shane? Uh, Gene, I've had a good time. Man, an hour went by quick. It was a pleasure talking with you uh, about Jesse the Body Ventura. There's no one like him. And not just in wrestling, but I think in life, all those hats we mentioned that he's worn. And thank you guys for joining us on Old School Dives. Hope you'll join us for Wildfire Tommy Rich next week. And if you've got questions or certain things about a particular topic, shoot them to Gene or I, and we'll get them That's in. Cool. And we're here to inform and entertain. So, If you got a wrestler that hadn't been you know, given the attention or, or you want to learn about them and you would like to see them as a future topic on the show, please send it to either one of us. They will get on. We have a, quite a list uh, compiled, but mm -hmm. we will add them to the list and uh, work them towards the top. But hey, always a pleasure, Shane. Uh, look forward to uh, seeing you Friday night in Piedmont, Alabama for Pro South mm -hmm. Wrestling, folks. Uh, make sure you check out that live stream. If you don't know where that's at, you can see it on both of our social medias. We'll be sharing that link. Uh, every Friday night, you can catch Pro South Wrestling right there in Piedmont, Alabama on Southern Avenue. And if you can't be there, you can catch on their YouTube. And uh, remember to subscribe to Cheapy TV on YouTube. We've got all kinds of great com content coming out all the time. We're going to be doing this regularly with me and Shane, Cheapy TV. Charles Anders has a podcast now. Check out the great episode he had with Wicked Nemesis. And we will see you again right here for Old School Dives. Mm -hmm.